Okay, let's begin everybody. Aloha and good morning everyone. Welcome to our webinar on scaling up operations. This is a normally a seminar that we do in person, but uh, because of the virus situation, we're obviously doing webinars uh, in the current high step season. This is uh, an annual event that's proven to be very popular and it's with uh, Innovate Hawaii. And we have uh, Wayne Inoue and Wayne Liagon here. And uh, later we'll have a company joining us, um, La Lima Tech. Uh, yeah, La Lima Tech. They'll be here shortly. Um, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Innovate Hawaii for being here. And of course, we thank DBET and SBA for the grant that allows us to put on this series of webinars. And to start, I'd like to introduce Jamie Lum from DBET, who can explain a bit about the High Step seminars and the High Step program in general, just to bring everybody up to speed. Jamie, please. Thank you, Rob. Aloha and good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us this morning uh, for another one of our High Step uh, webinar uh, series. We work with uh, the Hawaii Pacific Export Council to put these seminars on or these webinars on uh, for our Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program. And thank you, Rob, for putting up our website. Um, uh, everything that I talk about will be uh, is is uh, on our website and I encourage you to go there to the invest.hawaii.gov under the exporting tab to look up the high step program. So as Rob already mentioned, um, uh, the high step program is an export development program that's primarily supported by a grant from the Small Business Administration. And so DBED uh, administers the program for the state of Hawaii and we do work with uh, many partner organizations such as HPEC and such as uh, Innovate Hawaii, as well as others like the Small Business Development Center, uh, the Mink Center, uh, the, the Veterans Business um, Opportunity Center and um, others. So um, uh, we have three parts to our program. Uh, we have our uh, export readiness uh, of which this webinar is a part of that. And uh, these webinars are meant to um, give companies information about uh, various uh, export related topics, as well as uh, we do webinars that address uh, various markets and their opportunities uh, for Hawaii products and services. Um, let me backtrack a little bit. So the whole intent of the program really is to help Hawaii companies um, who are interested in exporting to begin exporting or for those companies who are already exporting uh, to continue to uh, look at other markets or introduce new products into markets they might already be in. So uh, the whole point of the program is really to get increase the number of Hawaii companies that are um, exporting and to increase the dollar amounts of Hawaii uh, made products and services. Um, so again, we have three parts to the program, our export readiness, um, we do webinars. We also have one-on-one -on -one, uh, business advising for companies that submit their registration form. We put you in touch with one of our partner organizations. Uh, so that will help companies to sort of uh, gear up. If you have an export plan, it will help you to uh, maybe uh, kind of tweak it. If you don't have one, it will help you to put one together. Um, the importance of having an export plan uh, is to help give you some you know, direction in where you wanna go, but it's also a, a crucial part of uh, one of our other components, which is our company assistance, where companies can apply for uh, up to $10,000 to help implement portions of their export strategy. So that's a second component. Uh, the last component we have is our Hawaii pavilions. Uh, of course, this has been um, hampered a little bit by uh, you know, the pandemic, um, many trade shows are not happening in person um, and are going virtual, uh, you know, travel is restricted. Uh, but the uh, company, um, uh, sorry, our Hawaii pavilions um, are basically uh, trade shows that we select to go into. Uh, we, we recruit a number of Hawaii companies and we go in as a group and exhibit under the Hawaii banner. Um, so step funds are used to primarily support um, 
participation in the trade shows. So um, again, you can go to our website and uh, look at all of these particular components in detail. And if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, but I'll turn it back to uh, Rob and in Innovate Hawaii. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Jamie. Okay, let's jump right in. Uh, introduce Wayne Lyagon from Innovate Hawaii and feel free to share your screen anytime, Wayne. Okay, mm, thanks, Rob. And take over. All right, here we go. So sharing my screen, hopefully everybody can see my first slide. Just double checking. We can, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I, I guess the topic for today is, you know, scaling up your operations. Um, in previous years, you know, we, we sort of attacked this um, topic from different angles. Uh, for this year, you know, I was hoping because we're doing things remotely, um, you know, and everything and everyone's, you know, doing uh, a lot of different things. I think if we can get a handle uh, on lean process improvement and how that will sort of benefit the companies now in the, the way they do things. Um, that's what I hope everyone will get out from, to, from today. So, uh, again, my name is Wayne Laigan. I'm our project manager at Innovate Hawaii. Uh, this is our general email. Should anyone have any questions, um, after the presentation, uh, there's also a phone number. Uh, again, most of the staff is working remotely. So if no one answers, uh, just leave a message and we'll, we'll have someone, uh, get back to you. And I'll, I'll go into more detail on, you know, how Innovate Hawaii relates to DBED, HTDC, because as you see on our website, you know, it is, uh, uh, we're, we're a program under the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. So again, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Innovate Hawaii is a program of the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation, HTDC. Uh, HTDC is attached to DBED. So that's the connection with the state. At the same time, um, Innovate Hawaii is part of a federal program um, called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. So the MEP is actually a public-private partnership that delivers solutions to U.S. manufacturers. So some of the things that that we do and our other centers do is we provide you know training programs and manufacturing assistance, and you know basically our goal is to advance manufacturing in Hawaii, right? And you know. We're here to, the, the three words that, that I always bring up is create, build, grow. You know, we're here to help manufacturers, you know, help create, create or develop new products, create jobs and opportunities for Hawaii. Uh, we're here to help, you know, build and raise awareness around manufacturing in Hawaii. Um, and then a lot of this is done through our, you know, fantastic partnerships, again, with DBED, HPEC, SPDC, VBOC. The Chamber of Commerce, all the all these small, you know, all these support organizations that are here for small, medium-sized businesses, and of course, the last one is, you know, help. We're here to help manufacturers uh, grow, uh, whether it's through bottom line, through energy efficiency, process optimization, like uh, what we're going to go over a little bit today, uh, and continuous improvement activities, as well as top line growth, right? Like, like the the purpose of High Step is to get companies to export. Um, and more recently, because of COVID and the way we do business, uh, uh, digital marketing and e-commerce. So as I mentioned earlier, right, Innovate Hawaii is part of our network. I'm just showing you this map. Uh, this is the MEP National Network. So it comprises, you know, uh, the NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership, uh, as well as 51 centers uh, located in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. Um, I think. At last count, we had about 1,300 trusted advisors and experts at nearly 600 MEP service locations. So what this means is that, you know, we, we can pretty much provide any manufacturer, uh, U.S. manufacturer, with access to the re resources they need to succeed. Uh, and again, just, just repeating, right, you know, all the centers in the MEP National Network are dedicated to serving small to medium-sized manufacturers through, again, market-driven technical assistance, training, and consulting services. So in Hawaii specifically, I think more recently, uh, these are some of the categories or uh, topics that we've been helping uh, companies with. Uh, production efficiency, uh, again, lean manufacturing, VSM or value stream mapping, and 5S. Uh, we'll go over a little bit 
uh, 5S in today's presentation. Uh, for food industry specific services, you know, we've helped a lot with food safety and food quality. So all the FISMA rules, uh, preventive controls for human food, HACCP or hazard analysis, critical control points, and GFSI. So for a lot of companies, a lot of food companies that are interested in exporting their product, um, they, they should consider looking at the Global Food Safety Initiative. Because again, FISMA and HACCP and, and FDA stuff is mainly for the U.S. because that, that FDA is only FDA only has jurisdiction in the U.S. Whereas GFSI, it's a globally recognized um, food safety and quality standard that you know I think once you get certified to that standard, you can sell to uh, pretty much uh, any company around the world. Um, another one that we work work with is. Uh, workforce development. Um, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit on this program that we have called Smart Talent. And it's pretty much uh, lean, um, using lean techniques, uh, lean principles in your onboarding process. And of course, we do have uh, uh, apprenticeship programs. Uh, if anyone is interested, uh, email us and we can go into more detail. Um, scaling up and Industry 4.0, uh, a topic that we'll discuss today and uh, with our panelists, um, our center director Wayne Inoue and Trung Lam from Laulima Mechatronics. You know, we'll, we'll we'll sort of discuss a little bit. You know, what we're planning to do in terms of automation and robotics, and how to uh, scale up local manufacturing and maybe introduce some industry 4.0 concepts. Um, as far as cybersecurity, um, we do work with uh, a lot of DoD companies um, that have to deal with DFARS and NIST 800-171. A new one that that that's uh, coming up is the CMMC or the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Um, and again, uh, if if this pertains to you, uh, reach out to us. Uh, it's a separate topic that we can discuss. Um, and then quality management is something that we've done for for a long time. ISO nine thousand and one uh, and AS ninety one hundred. If you were specifically in aeronautics. The last one on the bottom, it's it's more specific towards uh, technology companies. It's called tech scouting and TDMI. TDMI is technology driven market intelligence. So real quickly, what, what this does is uh, TDMI, it's using, um, we connect with you, try to get an idea of your technology and what you're currently applying it and see how we it can be applied to different markets. So it, it, it's a real broad, uh, topic based on you know what your company or your or, or technology you have, but it's real interesting because you know we have um, through our network you know we do reach out into a lot of different places or different uh, markets or opportunities that you probably didn't think of before. So again, that's, that's specifically towards uh, technology-driven market intelligence, um, not so much uh, market intelligence like how you would do for e-commerce or other things. So uh, I think this is the biggest question on everyone's mind, right? You know, when you get a big order, how will you fulfill it? Um, like I said, in the past, we would address these four categories, you know, supply chain, you know, business finances, equipment, and workforce. I think uh, what we'll do today is, you know, we'll revisit this, this question at the end after we've sort of gone through some of the lean process um, optimization things that, we, that, I, that I hope to cover. Um, and for those of you that, you know, this is just the, the four M's in manufacturing, you know, material, money, machinery, manpower. And I think uh, scaling up, you know, you do have to consider all these things and hopefully with uh, discussion and, you know, Q&A uh, with, with Wayne and Trung, you know, we can sort of answer some of these questions, specific questions that you guys might have. Uh, with that, um, th this is pretty much our agenda for today. I mean, um, normally in our lean manufacturing one-on-one -on -one class, you know, it's about a, a full day. We'll go over all the building blocks uh, in this house of lean. Uh, but for today, you know, we'll, we'll keep it short. We'll get an overview of, of the foundational things, um, like at the bottom, uh, eight ways and five S systems. And then I'll throw in um, standard work because I think in my opinion, uh, especially now, um, it's important for companies to start documenting the way they do things. So that way they are familiar with the process and can easily identify ways to improve it.
And again, yeah, um, if you have any questions regarding, you know, the four M's, material, money, machinery, manpower, uh, keep those in mind and we'll cover those in the Q&A at the end. So starting off, right, the definition of lean. So I'm just going to read this verbatim. A set of principles and practices which reduce costs through the relentless removal of wasteful activity and the simplification and standardization of manufacturing and support processes. And important thing is throughout the entire enterprise. So, you know, lean is a catch-all phrase, you know, we use to describe uh, methodologies and tools uh, to increase efficiency. Uh, again, uh, simplify tasks and reduce waste. Uh, and, and, and again, it's through the entire enterprise. So this means, you know, the, the entire value stream or even supply chain. So from supplier all the way through customer. So just keep these in mind, all right? Um, again, the, the three things we're gonna focus on today is removal of wasteful activity and the simplification and standardization of uh, manufacturing and support processes. So, so considering the value stream, right? You know, in order to define what is wasteful, you know, we need to know what brings value. Um, so a value added activity uh, from a lean standpoint is any activity that changes the fit, form or function uh, it's done right the first time and it's something that the customer is willing to pay for, right? Uh, a non-value added activity is activities that take time or resources, but do not directly contribute to the product or for service. So again, you know, you can think of this, right? You know, value added is a customer requirement, you know, is the customer willing to pay for it? Uh, from, that, from that point of view, you know, everything else uh, is non-value added. And you know, I think starting off for companies who haven't had any exposure to lean, uh, this is a tough concept. Uh, as you know, for for a lot of organizations, you know, um, we've engineered waste or pure waste, pure wasteful activities um, into our processes. Um, for machine shops, you know, like the, the last time I did this training, or when I, when I learned to do this training, you know, we were at a machine shop. You know, one of the, one of the examples that I brought up was deburring um, or inspection, right? So based on this definition, right, if everything is done right the first time, there should be no need to inspect or clean something at the end of the process. You know, um, but then in Hawaii, you have a little food food manufacturers cleaning uh, is required. Um, but but again, you know, from from these two definitions, right, cleaning. Uh, doesn't change the form, fit, or function of the product. So therefore, by, by these two definitions, cleaning or inspection is not value added. So um, just keep these, these two things in mind, value added and non-value added activity um, when we talk about the eight wastes in manufacturing or any process. So because of inspection and QA, QC, you know, we, we needed to add uh, third category. So again, value added, uh, if it's not clear <clears throat> whether a task is value added, you know, try imagining what would happen if you stopped doing it. So would your external or end customer complain? So if the answer is yes, then it probably is value added. Um, for non-value added activity, you know, pick, pick an activity. If you stop doing it now with any customer, whether it's internal, like next step in the process or external, know the difference. If, if nobody can figure it out if nobody notices uh, anything then it's, it's probably non-value added and can, can probably be removed from the process non-value added but necessary um, so again th this applies to a lot of things that are required by regulation so if you stop doing it now would your internal customer complain uh, if yes it's probably non-value added but necessary so again this is where the qa and qc uh, process steps come in um, because, you know, it's in real life, you know, there are things that we have to do, even though we don't like doing it. So um, lean all started probably with, you know, Toyota and the, there was an American engineer, uh, professor and management consultant. His name was Dr. William Edwards Deming. Um, from, from his experience, you know, he, he went to Japan, he studied with, with, with Toyota and he was probably the one that brought a lot of the lean concepts to the US. Um, most companies, um, based on his experience, you know, he, 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 he wrote and he used to always say that most companies 
who have not gone through a lean process improvement are about 5% value added. So it's kind of hard to grasp, right? If you look at your whole full day, um, when, when you make your products, it's saying that only 5% of your time is actually bringing value to the customer. Um, and the reason why I say this is if you consider a full work day, right? So eight hour shift, and that's about, you know, 60 minutes per hour, 480 minutes a day, right? Um, when you think about lunch and breaks, all those times are non-value added activity. Uh, if you think of meetings, uh, especially long meetings, non-value added activity, and everything else, like as we'll see when we, we start diving into the eight ways of manufacturing, you know, you'll see there's a lot of things that add up, that take up your time, uh, that take away from making the actual uh, product. Um, so a common improvement activity, uh, I should say a uh, common mistake is that most companies actually try to go after the value add activity. So I don't know if you guys, if you guys have experienced where um, you have bosses or companies telling their workers to work faster. So this isn't the point of lean manufacturing, right? Because considering 5% value added activity, if you tell people to work faster so they can produce more, you know, you'll maybe get a one or 2% improvement. But, you know, if you think about it, right, you know, um, um, like a lemon, for example, you know, when you're squeezing a lemon, you know, isn't it easier to squeeze the first ounce of juice from a lemon than the last ounce? And the reason why is that there's more to squeeze from the first ounce. And it's the same thing, same thing here, right? You know, instead of the last ounce would be the 5%. Um, so where's the real opportunity? And this goes into the next slide, you know, why focus on waste, right? So if lean companies or smart companies go after reducing the 95% non-value added activity, you know, they realize this much more savings. They'll get much more of their time back to produce uh, value added products. So uh, this slide is the, the uh, there's different acronyms uh, but what I like to use is uh, downtime. So defects, overproduction, waiting, non-utilized talent, transportation, inventory, motion, and excessive processing. So, you know, defects, I think obvious are, are the most recognizable forms of waste when it comes to lean, you know, especially when it comes to manufacturing. In manufacturing, you know, this, this could be, you know, missing or incomplete assemblies and products that need reworking and uh, scrap components or, you know, ingredients. Uh, this waste is one of the biggest when it comes to manufacturing, since it also leads to overprocessing, transportation, and overproduction. Uh, defects occur in the office also. Um, again, lean applies to any process, um, and you, you can look at all these uh, eight ways uh, in any process and find examples. Um, we also do training for lean uh, in the office setting, uh, where instead of dealing with a product, we're dealing with information and paperwork. Um, an example is uh, incorrect invoice amounts, wrong customer IDs, or emails uh, that are actually sent to the wrong person and spelling errors. So again, those are examples of defects in the office setting. So overproduction, you know, if, if there's one waste that can negatively impact the success of an organization as a whole, I think it's overproduction. You know, when, when you produce more, too much product, um, you know, you're using up a, a lot of extra material uh, than customers are willing to buy. Um, and then, and also when you overproduce, you generate inventory that, or finished goods that you eventually need to store. So if you think of it from a business standpoint, you know, you're, you're creating more stuff to store, more inventory to manage and you know, especially in Hawaii, right? Warehouse space, storage space is, uh, uh, is a premium. Um, and also overproduction leads to, you know, motion again, because you, you have to move around to produce more waiting because inventory is just sitting and waiting to be sold. And, and then inventory because, you know, all the overhead costs associated with storing and managing um, products. So in the office, you know, uh, going back to the office example, you can start working on a presentation for a meeting too early. And then there's a chance that the meeting gets delayed or canceled. And at that point, you know, you will have wasted that time or have, or could have 
<clears throat> gone back to update your slide with the latest information. So uh, where this is going is that, you know, um, with lean, a lot, a lot of people that do lean transformations, you know, the goal is to do just in time. And I think we understand in Hawaii, you know, that's not possible because of the shipping times that we have. But uh, if we can reduce the amount of inventory we have on hand and secure, you know, good supplies, suppliers and good relationships that, you know, when we need it, it'll be re readily available. Whereas, you know, uh, buying in bulk, for example, uh, one of the things that we cover in our normal training is inventory turns. Um, I hope um, as companies scale up, they're not buying one year's worth of raw ingredients and storing it. So if there's a way to break that down in smaller chunks, um, we, we've actually worked with some companies um, that have negotiated rates where they would commit to buying a whole year of material, but at uh, regularly spaced um, shipping intervals. So that way they don't need a larger warehouse to store everything. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh, the next waste is waiting. Um, that one's pretty self-explanatory. You know, it's waiting for information or items to arrive from the previous step in the process. So for example, when producing a product for customers, <clears throat> excuse me, any inaction that increases costs is known as waiting. Uh, this waste, this is waste because while the product waits for transformation, the organization, organization is incurring overhead. Uh, essentially, any potential profit that the product would have made, made from being sold is continuously stripped as you know, waiting occurs. So waiting again, uh, as you talked about earlier, you know, eventually contributes to inventory waste. And on top of destroying the flow of information and products and materials, you know, waiting occurs in service processes as well such as waiting for approvals, waiting for someone to return from vacation, waiting due to confusion or indecision. Um, so again, manufacturing and office settings, right? Or, or any process, you know, there's a lot of waiting. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, especially in <clears throat> uh, larger organizations, uh, there's a lot of waiting because uh, of the appro approval process. And it's just the way that the systems were built and a uh, good example is we actually worked with uh, one of the community colleges. Um, we we did a value stream map, and we saw that you know the value added activity. If everyone was in the same room at the same time, um, the approval process for an 89 day hire uh, would take about 28 minutes. And I think from the value stream that we did of their current state, we saw that it took nearly 28 days for the approval process to go through. And the main reason why is because the application, the, the forms would wait at different steps in the process. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that caused this was uh, batching, right? The people that were doing their approvals would wait till the end of the week to do all the forms and do all the approvals. Um, N or the non unionized talent. Again, this, this ways, you know, it affects, uh, it affects different types of organizations in various industries. Uh, this, this waste happens when, you know, management doesn't use all of its workers to their fullest ability. Um, so think real short, you know, there's, there's a saying about having the right people on the bus. This, this uh, relates to that in saying that we need the right people in the right seats on the bus. Transportation is unnecessary movements of, of materials or information. Uh, when products, equipment, inventory, tools, and people uh, move further than they need to. Uh, this generates waste. Um, again, you know, just the time needed to go look or go find something, right? Inventory uh, pertains to items or information not being processed. Uh, and again, it's all about storage or holding on to things. Um, motion is unnecessary or excessive movements within the workspace. So a little bit different from transportation. Transportation is within the facility. Motion is in, in your work area or workspace. So <clears throat> this relates to ergonomics and, and having you know, all the tools and supplies available uh, within reach to do the work that you're, you're trying to do. And the last one is uh, excessive processing. So when there are more steps or, com or components or work being put into a product um, than is uh, required or needed for the process to continue. Um, a good example of this was there was a manufacturer that we worked with in, in uh, that made tires. 
um, there was a worker there uh, at the end of the line. Uh, his job was to wrap every single tire with shrink wrap and, and then stack it on pallets. So, you know, that, that, was, a, that was a surprise to me and, and some of the other um, MEP consultants that were working with the company because, you know, we, we never saw that before. You know, we never saw any, any other company that wrapped tires. So we started asking questions. We asked, you know, the production manager, we asked the, the general manager why, why they were wrapping the tires at the end of the line. And, you know, eventually we found out that that, that was the way they did it. Uh, the company was an old company, you know, it was, it was generational. It started, uh, you know, from the grandparents, passed, passed down to the, the uh, kids and grandkids. And nobody really questioned it until, until we did. And, um, the reason why they were wrapping the tires was because that's how they always did it. And I think it was because uh, when they first started making tires, they used to do white wall tires. So um, we don't see too much of those today, but if you know what white wall tires are, it's, you know, instead of being all black, the side walls are white. And they wrap the tires because during shipping, they would, they would find out that uh, the tires would get dragged or would get dirty and then uh, customers would complain. So based on a customer complaints, they would wrap each and every tire. But that, but that was a long time ago. Since then, you know, the they found they you know they stopped making white wall tires with just regular black rubber tires, and they 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 went and asked their customers, you know, how they what they thought about the extra shrink wrap, and a lot of them, you know, finally voiced that it is actually wasting them time too because they they had somebody unwrapping every tire, and then. Uh, all the shrink wrap would actually fill up their trash bins. So after that was questioned, you know, they, they stopped that process and it, it sort of increased their throughput because one of the bottlenecks that they identified was that wrapping process at the end. So quick example again of uh, value added versus non-value added activity, you know, uh, in, in a lumber yard, right? Whenever the saw or the blade cuts wood, that's building value in the lumber that they're selling. Everything else on the right-hand side, handling wood, cleanup, quality checks, banding bundles, moving bundles, changing blades, breaks, lunches, meetings, adjusting the saw, paperwork, you know, fr from our definition of value added versus non-value added, everything on the right would be considered non-value added activity. Uh, some of these again could be, um, non-value added, but necessary. But with, with this in mind, you know, one of the things that Lean looks at is how to reduce or eliminate some of the non-value activity. Uh, one question I always bring up is, does the operator, the person that does the value added work need to do all the non-value added work? Um, and this is where um, in our regular trainings, we go over, you know, the, the support persons that can help people, you know, do some of these things while, the person that has all the skill and expertise can continue doing what they're doing. So again, and hopefully you guys can see, you know, that lean uh, applies to a lot of different, different um, industries, right. Or, or uh, processes, product development, like engineering services, order taking and scheduling, manufacturing, logistics, administrative systems, uh, human resources, again, the onboarding process, uh, everything. Um, a process is a process is a process. And uh, I mean, a good example is Subway, right? They, they have Subway sandwiches. They have single piece flow with standard work. They even have visual controls. I don't know if you guys ever noticed on the counter, they have uh, a little jig where they line up the bread and then they have a, a little notch there where they can cut the foot long sandwich into six, six inch or even into quarters and thirds. Uh, hospitals are uh, another example, right? Each room is set up the same way with all the supplies in designated locations. So that whenever, you know, uh, a response team is in there or support team, you know, they don't have to search for equipment or supplies. Grocery stores, you know, they do first in, first out. They replenish from the back and pull from the front. Um, and then, uh, you know, just, I'll just throw in a quote from uh, Dr. Deming, right? If you can't describe what you're doing as a process, then you don't know what you're doing. And this is just an example of uh, one thing that you guys can take away from the eight waste discussion is, you know, you can do what's called a waste walk, right? You can walk around your facility. You can look at examples of, you know, the, the waste we have identified, defects, downtime, right? And then some of the implications, you know, some example of defects, right? You know, incorrect parts from the supplier, 
And some of the implications of this, you know, re this leads to rework, scrap, and, you know, warranty issues. Um, from office setting, defects again, incomplete information, and this could lead to customer complaints. So just something simple that we usually do with the companies when we're on site, you know, when we do assessments, you know, we, we bring this along and then we, we just walk around with you and see, you know, we, we just, you know, look at um, downtime and see where uh, improvements could be made. Uh, this one I've shown in the past, you know, how can a plate of spaghetti help lean your process? This one relates to, you know, office layout or plant layout, right? You know, here you can see, you know, what's called the spaghetti diagram. Uh, it's pretty much tracking the movement of workers or products or information uh, from different workstations. You know, ideally, you'd like little to no overlap. So L-shaped, S-shaped, or U-shaped. Uh, this is something simple that companies can do. Um, um, and usually costs, you know, little to no um, uh, resources and money. Um, and again, you know, real quick things like this can really do, really make a big difference. Um, we understand, you know, there's monuments in the facility or large pieces of equipment that can't be moved. But, but I think just doing this exercise where you map out, you know, the, the flow uh, of uh, material and information, uh, you, you can start to identify things that can be improved. Um, 5S is, is a, a workplace organization method that describes, you know, um, workplace organization that, that sort of, you know, describes, you know, how to organize your workplace for efficiency and effectiveness. And um, again, this was developed in Japan. So the five S's are sort, set in order, shine, standardize, sustain, and you know, th this is probably the reason why this is a foundation for continuous improvement is because uh, it doesn't make sense to try and uh, make the other processes more efficient when, when you're still looking and, and um, finding um, tools, materials, um, and things you need to complete the work uh, within the facility. So real quickly, I mean, sort is to keep only the necessary items in place. Uh, again, the hopes of um, doing this is to reduce time looking for something. Uh, it reduces the chance of distractions, and it also helps simplify inspection. Um, set in order is to simplify or arrange items that promote efficient workflow. Uh, again, the, the key is here is smooth and easy, and this is where point of use comes in. So again, point of use relates to having all the items that you need to complete the work within reach and, and putting more frequently use items closer to the workspace. Oh, excuse me, closer to the workspace. Um, shine, uh, this one is cleaning the work area and uh, you know, inspecting the tools on a regular basis while cleaning. You know, this, this, this helps with safety and improves you know, production efficiency and reduces uh, errors uh, in the process. Um, one rule of thumb is that you know, you, when you're doing your, your walks or inspections of uh, different work, work areas, you, know, you should be able to detect any problems within 50 feet uh, in five seconds. Standardized is, is setting up the rules uh, that you know, put sort, set in order, and shine in place. And again, it, it just standardizing just to ensure that everyone knows their responsibilities. And when you're thinking of standardizing, you know, um, I encourage everyone to use visual as much as possible because uh, a lot of words, uh, it's usually um, not as effective. Um, and we'll go through a little bit of examples uh, in the following slides. And sustain is the last S. Uh, it's all about maintaining and reviewing standards. And so that, you know, once the system is put in place, everyone in the organization, you know, can do things without being told such as, you know, um, the other S's in the 5S system. So just, just some examples, again, office setting, right? If I were, if I were to tell you, oh, find me this, this uh, report on your desk, you know, it'll be a lot harder to find when it's, it's it all a mess like this. Um, and this is where I wanted to sort of try and exercise with you guys. So, you know, normally we would do this in person. Um, we can't, but, um, Bear with me. Uh, so this is our current workspace, right? This is sort of going to walk through the different 5S, uh, 5Ss in 5S. So this is our current workspace. Um, on the right, 
um, all shifts. So we're gonna do this for 20 seconds. Um, our task, um, you, don't you don't have a sheet of paper, but maybe you can just sort of um, eyeball it on your screen is to strike out the numbers one to 49. So in this case, we can't strike it out physically, but if you can locate the numbers one through 49 in the correct sequence. So when I say go, I'll give you guys 20 seconds to find the numbers one to 49 in our non 5S workspace. Okay, ready, set, go. So numbers one through 49, and normally, you know, in, you know, in traditional, you know, workspace, so this is where, you know, the boss would be telling you to go, telling you to hurry up. You can do it. You can find the numbers one through 49. It's real simple. So 20 seconds. And then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of discuss, right? I mean, I'll, I'll probably just talk out loud uh, what worked and what didn't work. Okay. So that was about 20 seconds, right? So in this disorganized workspace, right? Finding one through 49, I think it was a challenge. Um, a lot of people, I think in this first round, the, the highest that I've seen got up to like maybe 20. Um, I'm not sure how much you guys you guys got, but you know, thinking again of, of 5S, you know, what, what can we do, right? So we can sort, so we can keep only the necessary items. So in the next round, you know, what I've done is I've sorted out the numbers. I've removed unnecessary numbers. I removed the numbers five through 90, which are not needed. So again, uh, in this round, uh, uh, the shift is 20 seconds. Well, I'll give you guys 20 seconds again to find the numbers one through 49. And ready, set, go. So as you can see, you know, it's, it's a little bit more manageable now. Uh, you, you, can, you can more easily find the numbers in the correct sequence. Um, the numbers again, didn't change from the previous slide. All we did was we sorted. We removed the unnecessary numbers. So in this case, in real life, this would be removing unnecessary tools, unnecessary <clears throat> products, uh, or things that don't um, that you don't currently use in the current work workspace. All right. So that was about 20 seconds. So you guys, um, normally, you, you, should, you should have been able to locate more numbers. And, and hopefully, you know, you guys can see by just removing unnecessary items, you know, it cleared up the area. It made us uh, a lot more efficient. Um, normally, I would time everyone to see how, how, how fast they got. And we would do, you know, we'd set up charts to sort of, you know, do this more analytically. But because we're doing it remotely, I'm just hoping that everyone's trying to do it uh, and play along. So again, uh, set in order, you know, the goal is to eliminate the go look for and go get activities, which are waste and don't add value to the product or process. Uh, this, this again relates to point of use, um, having work instructions, you know, at, at the workstation always help. And then having the appropriate <clears throat> inventory levels and supplies at the workstation, uh, nothing extra. So again, uh, set in order uh, in, in this workspace, you know, we, we, we took it up one more notch. We installed racks uh, and we organized the workspace. So uh, what you'll see when they hit next is um, sort, of like, sort of like a grid. So you start off from the bottom to the top and left to right. So just an example, right? the number one, based on this, uh, this or organization scheme, the number one will be in the bottom left corner. Number two will be in the middle uh, left box. So again, I'll give you guys 20 seconds to find the numbers one through 49. And just, just follow that sequence, right? Bottom to top, left to right. And hopefully you guys can, can start to see, right? You know, as, as we move along in, in 5S, this is a real simple example. But what, what this exercise hopes to show is that, you know, through simple things, uh, using 5S systems as the foundation, you know, you can improve your processes dramatically. Uh, again, this is just numbers on paper, but if you can apply these certain techniques to your work area, whether it's in the office or the manufacturing setting, um, and especially if you time it um, and, and compare the cycle times for before and after, uh, you'll see uh, the differences. So that was about 20 seconds again. Hopefully everyone's still trying to 
play along. But uh, hopefully uh, everyone was able to get closer to 49, if not all the way to 49. Um, and then Shine, we're going to skip, but this is a, just an example of Shine. Uh, th this is, again, a, a, a paper mill uh, that we visited. And on the left side, on the before picture, right, nobody noticed that there was a bolt missing um, because, you know, everybody just overlooked it because it was a dirty piece of equipment. Um, after cleaning it, <clears throat> they, they, they replaced the bolt, but they also noticed that there was a hairline fracture. So you can see that, that little crack <clears throat> on the right side. So eventually that got fixed. But again, these are some of the things that weren't uh, easily noticed because the equipment wasn't inspected and cleaned uh, normally. So in our 5S numbers game or uh, company, you know, we're going to skip the shine. We're going to go straight into standardization. So what we did for you in this round is we standardized the numbers into logical order. So we've done the sort, we've done a set in order, we skipped the shine and we've standardized the work workspace. So again, I'll give you 20 seconds. And then uh, the goal is to strike or find the numbers in sequence from one to 49. So again, as you can see, you know, once everything's standardized, sorted, standardized, set in place, you know, um, this turns into a real simple task that I think everyone can do relatively quickly. Um, so this completes pretty much the exercise for this one, but, but you know, looking at this, so what's the big deal, right? If when we remove wasteful activity from the process, you know, that, re that resulted in more value added time. This gives you more time in the 20 seconds to do, let's say we, we had multiple sheets, we could, we could cross out more numbers. But at the same time, you know, uh, we can do this. So we're back at the original workspace, right? Let's say I give you guys 20 seconds and this time we're, we're quality managers. You know, if I ask you to perform a quality check, um, what numbers um, are missing? So again, by applying 5S, right? This is the non-5S work, workspace, you know, doing quality in a disorganized or uh, unorderly fashion. You know, it'll, it'll make quality checks and inspections real hard. I'm gonna skip ahead real quick. <clears throat> so after, let's say we implement 5S, right? Remember our standardization example? As you can see, once we sort it, we set in place, we standardize. Looking at this, you can quickly see which numbers are missing. So in 1 to 49, we can see that the number 13 and the number 36 are missing. So again, you know, just these three things, right? Three things are, are the, I guess, the, the basis for 5S. Again, standard work, uh, we skipped shine uh, because in this case, it didn't apply. And then sustain was, was the other one. But Hopefully in a simple example, right, you know, you know, for you, uh, what this means, right, L looking from before and after, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a more pleasant work environment, you know, it makes the job certainly easier. Uh, for the company, you know, it, this means lower costs since, you know, more value added time is gained. Uh, you improved safety by retention, by reducing potential hazards, right? If this were a real workspace and this was like tires or wires and, you know, equipment all over the place, you know, um, that, that does a lot of trip hazards and some of the things that, you know, you would you would normally do for, for safety. Uh, increased standardization, again, helps. And also the <clears throat> workspace on the right will make training employees a lot easier. So standard work sequence, right? I'm, I'm just going to go over this real quickly. You know, if, if you, it's, do, it's a specific order in which the operator performs the steps of the process, uh, safety is at the highest priority, and then quality, and then sustainable pace. So, um, what this means is that you know choosing the best process out of which the current circumstances allow. And the reason why I put this up here is because you know Henry Ford um, used standard work, and he was able to you know reduce his uh, build time for from 13 hours for one vehicle to 2.5 hours. And it's all about you know standardizing the way they do and continuous improvement by slowly building uh, improvements into the process and reducing waste. Um, I'm going to skip ahead because we're we're at uh, 9:53 right now, but we have uh, Wayne Inoue and Trung Lam. 
um, like to introduce them on the call. And uh, remember those four M's that I talked about uh, in the beginning, um, materials, money, manpower, and machinery. Um, maybe, maybe Trung, maybe you can introduce yourself, uh, your company, and uh, some of the things that you're doing to help us with uh, automation and robotics. Because uh, I know that's a topic that I think a lot of people are interested in uh, when they tune into the scaling up operations. Uh, sure thing. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, my name is Trung Lam. I run Laulima Mechatronics. We are a automation consulting company and with a focus on implementing robotics, uh, specifically cobots or collaborative robots into manufacturing uh, facilities. Uh, we're looking to help companies scale up uh, by automating repetitive tasks that uh, have a high risk of repetitive stress injury or um, that are mundane enough where it's difficult finding workers who want to do the work. So that is our target focus right now. We currently have uh, one robot on order that we are going to be implementing into a food manufacturer here in Honolulu. And we will also have it on display in partnership with Innovate Hawaii at the Entrepreneur Sandbox when it comes in. So keep an eye out for that. You can come take a look at the robot uh, play around with it and see how it could help you and your business. Thanks, Trung. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just ask questions, you know, you hope to sort of stir up the Q&A portion of uh, this, this webinar, but um, maybe for Wayne and Trung, and you know, if you guys can talk about, you know, what are some of the reasons um, you, would, uh, you would consider automating if you were a manufacturer, right? Is, is, it just, is it just mainly increased productivity? You know, what are some of the things that, you know, you look at or you encourage companies to look at when considering to automate? Uh, for me, it, I usually look at what state they are in terms of their, their scale. Uh, if, if they're producing high enough volume where it justifies the, the price of the equipment, that's probably the biggest one. But I try to listen to the stories of, of the managers or the owners that I'm talking to. If, if they sound like there are big pain points that are keeping them up at night, or that's really slowing them down or stressing them out. And beyond just the quality of the product, but a quality of life of both the employees and the owner, like I, I tend to look at that a little bit more than, than just the return on investment. Like it may take you a little longer to pay back that piece of equipment, but if it makes your stress go down 50%, then I think it's totally worth it. So it's kind of both, uh, quantitative analysis as well as just uh, qualitative uh, in, in terms of how automation can help any manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I mean, um, on the money side, right. You know, um, I think um, for me, uh, a lot of companies should, should really get in touch with their financial advisor. So, so I know SBDC, VBOC, um, the Patsy Mink center, you know, they all provide, you know, uh, financial advice, right. To businesses. And so sort of like what you mentioned, right, you know, um, the stress level goes down, but at the, same, at the same time, you know, there is a certain point when automation makes sense, right? That's where the return on investment comes in, you know, so you're not scooping and scaling on the weekends. And, you know, just, just to produce more, you, you need to scale up. Um, I guess um, based, based on your experience or based on what, what you guys have seen, you know, when there is an uh, uh, increase in demand, uh, but but it's at, it comes at ir irregular intervals, so it's not sustained growth, but it's it's just a one big order. Um, how would companies? How would you recommend companies? You know, um, attack that or overcome those uh, you know production challenges. Yeah, that's that's tough. If it's not like a sustained order, you you can't really automate because it takes time to choose an equipment, purchase, get it shipped in. So I, I think what I would do is use it as a test. Um, do you have enough room if that was a regular sustained order? And if not, then maybe automation makes a lot of sense. Because if, if your goal is to get to that sustained level, then you're going to have to automate at that point. It, being in Hawaii, rent's very expensive. So you don't want to have excess space you're not using. So at some point, you're, you're really going to outgrow your space. And that's probably one of the... the main ways people notice that they need to automate is they run out of room and it's like it's like you're that that uh hermit crab in the shell that's too small and if you gotta 
you got to find a bigger shell sometimes, but you know why it's really hard. So then automation, uh, so people can work in, in closer quarters or, or tasks can be done in smaller spaces makes a lot of sense. I would say if, if you have a, a one-off contract or just a one-time thing, is it's Hawaii, right? Call your friends, call your family, try to get it done, but try to learn as much as you can. Like um, maybe do more assembly line work at that point. Like let's say, you know, a piece of equipment does this one task like have one person just do that one task to kind of replicate what the equipment would do and see how that works in your process flow. So kind of have, have people uh, act out what the automation equipment would do and see if that would work for your process. One thing, Wayne, maybe I can add, and um, this is Wayne Inouye. One thing that I think what kind of sums up what Chung was saying and what we've been talking about this this morning that it's really important for at least our local manufacturers, the word scalability. You know, people need to understand how to scale. You know, everything that we talked about this morning is about being efficient. And as long as you're efficient, you're gonna be able to scale a little bit easier and quicker. And what I mean by that is, you know, we need, you know, living here in Hawaii, we need to adjust to the times of our economy. You know, we have the pandemic now and, you know, again, we'll, we'll have ups and downs of our economy as we move forward. And especially for our local manufacturers, understanding and what Chung was saying about understanding how you produce is really important. And I think what, you know, what we're trying to do with maybe the robotics is that will help companies try to understand how to scale more efficiently. Um, by using robots, you could, you know, again, uh, maybe crank out more product using a robot versus trying to hire people and train them to do stuff on your production line. But I, the one comment I just wanted to leave with everybody is, you know, this is really important to, you know, understand the word scalability within your own company and having a good sense of how you can leverage friends and family or how you can leverage certain things in your production line is really important. So just wanted to leave everybody with that one kind of, you know, thing in your head is, you know, how do I scale? Because at some point, like what Chung said, if you get a big order, whether it's from Japan, whether it's from California, you know, you don't want to invest money to purchase more equipment or hire a ton you know, just to fulfill that order, because that's not a long-term sustainable order. If it is, that's great. Then you can make the capital investment. But, you know, the way things are, things are going to come in waves and you can't necessarily spend your own capital. You can't invest in, in hiring a whole bunch of people to fulfill this order and then let them go later on. That's really not effective. And it's not, you know, it's not saving you any money. So understanding again, how to adjust to these, these certain times in the economy, how to adjust to these big, you know, purchase orders that you're going to get is really important. So I just want to leave everybody with that. And Chung, I hope that, Kind of ties into where automation comes in, where you can utilize robots and automation to help manufacturers of different sizes scale more more easily. So yeah, yeah and was, it also it also ties into the lean manufacturing. So so if anytime you have a big order, even if you are automated, like big orders still stress your system, and and if you are not lean, like all those issues are going to pop up in many different ways, and you're going to be putting out a lot of fires left and right every single time. But if you are lean and if you have gone through the steps, then you are prepared. Uh, you only have to deal with scaling. Like the system will work fine. And you're just trying to answer this question. Okay, how do I scale this up to handle larger volumes? So you're, you're not, all your attention can be focused specifically on that one problem. And that's very helpful. And, and you know, the company I worked at, at, which is a bakery, we went from, you know, a small shop to, to handling hotels and restaurants. And, and we, we scaled up rapidly. And we were, we were forced to implement a lot of lean manufacturing methodologies because it was really tough. We ran into tons of issues when we didn't focus on it. Um, and once you're lean and you understand your process very well and everything's organized and, and, and it's clear from top down, from owner to employee, what the process is, bringing in robotics, bringing in equipment is much easier because everyone understands what the steps are. And when you explain to people um, hey, this, this, this piece of equipment is not here to replace you, right? This piece of equipment is to here to help you do your job better. 
and to help you focus your energy on the more important things that you know we need to focus on in this company. It, it, it makes buy-in from, from the staff as well as ownership much, much quicker once everyone understands the process of manufacturing and it's clear and it's organized. So I, I think, I think um, automation and lean manufacturing go hand in hand. Thanks, Trung. Yeah, she took some of my notes, but... <clears throat> <laughs> Hey, sorry, sorry. Seating the thunder, but yeah, no, I mean, th thanks. I mean, it, it was well said. I mean, uh, since you brought up the bakery, I mean, um, one of the things that, you know, um, I've seen companies go through when they're scaling up, right, is when they have to make larger quantities, you know, because scaling up you know, simply says that you're, you're making larger quantities of your product in a similar time span, you know, but scaling up, you know, I think it leads to changes in how you make your product along the way. You know, for example, if you're making one, one, one bread a day, using your KitchenAid mixer and a regular oven, you know, chances are you won't be able to make a hundred of those breads using the same equipment. Um, some companies that, that I've run into think that, you know, I just, if, if I need a hundred bread, I'll just buy a hundred KitchenAids, but that's not the way to do it. Right. That, that, that's scaling. Isn't just multiplying, right. It, it, it also involves, you know, uh, properly specking out equipment. So I guess right. maybe, maybe based on your experience, you know, um, where would companies go uh, to get an idea of uh, what's out there so they, they know what kind of equipment's out there that they could possibly use and how should they spec it out? Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways. Uh, the easiest one is definitely the internet. If you're, you're early days and you're just after a hard day at work and you're tired and you have a very specific task in mind that really like, wreck your body or like it's hard to find employees who want to do it you can always google it right and it and if you and if you can find something then you can reach out to folks like innovate who can help uh explain uh the, the equipment what it can do they have consultants that can help you um often at no cost to help you choose the right piece of equipment but i think spending that uh, bit of time at the beginning just to understand if kind of just that equipment that you're trying to or the task you're trying to automate if that equipment even exists. And if you can find something great, if not, then there are consultants who can help you as well. And once you work together to kind of find that piece of equipment that, that everyone agrees is, is the right fit for your business at its current size, then there are local distributors who can bring the equipment in for you. They can install, they can service. And there's even online stores you can buy from as well, but you kind of just lose that service component. So mm -hmm. the beauty of the internet, there's lots of ways uh, to, to get an answer for your problem. Because I know in the past, uh, I know, I know uh, two years ago, you know, we brought up a small group to Pack Expo. I mean, it, it was specific to packaging and processing equipment. And I think that's one way, too, that I'll throw out is, uh, you know, attending, you know, expos or trade shows for, for equipment manufacturing or equipment vendors and manufacturers. Um, that's one way to get, to get a feel for what's out there. Uh, they usually have live demos and you can you can speak with a lot of salespeople who tell you all the right things. Um, so just, just be wary, right. You know, that, you know, everything there is nice and perfect, but it's also good to dig a little bit deeper and see if you can get, you know, references for other yeah. companies that have the equipment and you can talk to them about how it is uh, through daily use. That's crazy. You know, from Hawaii, like everything, we think big is like, Blaisdell Center, right? But you go to these expos and, and those places are big. So you're talking about like five or six exhibition halls of just packing equipment. So it's like a three day, four day event where you're walking like nine, 10 miles a day just to see everything. Um, with, with COVID and everyone kind of being stuck, a lot of these expos have gone virtual and uh, tickets are a lot cheaper, oftentimes free now. You're not, you're not paying for a flight, hotel and, and tickets to, to, to attend. And there's videos and there's a, uh, representatives there that you can like chat with. It's actually, it's actually really nice going to the virtual expo. So I would look into that as well. Yeah, so I think one question that we got uh, in the past uh, regarding, you know, the four M's was, was relating to materials or supply chain, you know, because um, for a lot of companies, right, you know, they, they work with their suppliers and whenever a company goes through, you know, uh, an increase in demand, you know, they, they also have to consider if their suppliers can handle the increase in demand. I mean, this is especially important if, let's say, you're a, you're a food processor and your product comes from something that's grown in Hawaii, right? Um, how long does that farm uh, 
or how long will that farm take to grow, right? So um, maybe Wayne or, or Trung, maybe any comments on the supply chain and getting those ready for increased demand and orders. You want me to take it, Wayne? Yeah, sure. I think you a little bit more. <laughs> make some comments yeah. but I think you have the I, I think it depends on on your manufacturing and what you're making uh I'm going to talk about food cuz most of Hawaii manufacturing is food it's it's a it's a big challenge uh when you're using the the closer you get to the farm the, the bigger the challenge the challenge is for for an example we were, we were trying to make a product that required local honey and we had a customer who wanted it and and if they were to buy it it wouldn't be for like one or two stores it was going to be like for 400 stores <laughs> so we went to the the honey farm we were like hey uh we need to up our order and can how long would it take for you to to scale up and when we told them the quantity they're like oh we can never make that much we don't have enough space in our in our farm so i, I think talking to your your suppliers like having a good relationship is very important especially if you're in food especially if you're trying to buy local, especially if you're trying to buy fresh, there's a lot of uh, inventory issues when it comes to that. And there's a lot of value as well, getting local and getting high quality fresh products. Um, just, but just understand that if, if that's the route you're going, there's gonna be inventory challenges. And, and the best way is just to maintain a good relationship with your suppliers. Even if you don't need anything, check, check in on them, see if, see if there's anything you do to help them. Cause there may be a day when you know, they have like 10 of something and you need nine and there's someone else wants three and maybe they'll give you your order because you're just nice to them. So that's, that's the whole I style, right? <laughs> right. Um, you know, I just to add on to Chunk, you kind of took my point as well was you really got to, you know, get to know your, your suppliers. Um, but also you get, you need to understand your customers as well because your customers can help you to understand where they're going and actually that helps you make that conversation with your suppliers so just you know understanding you know like chung said having that relationship with both your suppliers and your end customers so that you can do better forecasting um there's there's software out there there's you know a lot of things out there that can help you with forecasting but you can't really take the place of personal relationships with your your suppliers and your your end customer so just wanted to point how important that is and, and one thing, you know, you got to remember we're in the middle of the ocean. There is no such thing as just in time manufacturing, right? Um, you know, many companies on the mainland that we've worked with before, they do what is called just in time manufacturing. So their supplies or their raw products are shipped in maybe the day before they, they start producing. For us, it's a little bit different, right? Everybody, any, everything, the majority of, of stuff that we use or our manufacturers use come on a boat. So we can't necessarily do just in time manufacturing because that's just not possible. We can't, and there is no overnight FedEx, right? It's usually two to three days. So just something to remember, right? So, you know, just in time manufacturing doesn't work here in Hawaii. So we need to pay, you know, exceptionally more attention to ordering, forecasting. And, and getting to know our suppliers and, and, and customers so we can, you know, get a leg up on kind of where you think this, uh, your manufacturing schedule is going to head. So just wanted to make that yeah. comment. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And if you're at the scale where you're, you're able to buy direct and it's not a year's worth of inventory or maybe it's like two or three months of inventory, it does make sense to invest in ERP solutions to kind of help you forecast, track inventory. But if maybe you're not at that scale, a lot of our local distributors do a very good job of forecasting. So if you work with the the, the H and W's, the Cisco's, and the Waihatas, uh, and the produce distributors, they 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 kind of know what their customers use, so they can forecast. And and it's not quite just in time, but you know it's within two or three days of, of getting you what you need. And and they have a pretty high rate of success in, in making sure they're not out of stock. Um, so it may be if you're at a stage right now where you're just ordering things online uh, on a small scale. And you kind of want to take that next step, maybe approach one of those uh, local distributors. Great. Yeah. So, so I know we touched on a little bit about supply chain, uh, business finances. You know, we, we mentioned, you know, that they should speak to their, their financial advisor to see, you know, where, where the company is. And it, it makes sense to make large capital investments. Uh, we talked about equipment. Um, the last thing is uh, manpower or workforce. Um, you know, um, 
with with automation and robotics, you know, especially the one that you're you're looking to bring in, you know, what's the learning curve for that? Maybe talk, talk a little bit about uh, ease of use or um, ease of reconfiguring the cobot that you're looking at. Uh, the cobot we're bringing in is designed for bakeries and. The way this one is set up, the, the company handles most of the software development, which makes sense since we're just starting off. There, there's not a lot of people familiar with the software here. So to start off, the company can handle a lot of the programming for you. But this robot at some point is able to be programmed on site by technicians. And, and the beauty of cobots is, is unlike other robots, they're designed to work near and with other people as well. So the safety factor is very high. Um, for, it's, it, it's designed to move in a way where it can be food safe. So with food production, you don't want any kind of non-food grade oils uh, over food. So this robot, uh, the software is able to move around where no part of the robot is ever over the food, which I think is a huge benefit uh, compared to other solutions. And um, yeah, so we're integrating in food production and bakeries for now, but the, the product, the beauty of Cobot, since it's just a robot arm, it's very flexible. So it can handle uh, palletizing, it can move trays, it could uh, open and close containers for you, fold boxes, uh, pick up and pick and place product uh, on and off conveyor belts if you want. And since it's on a cart with wheels, you can move it around your production facility. So you could have it handle multiple processes and just have one robot at a time. So it's it's uh, flexible and cost effective in that way. I guess, I guess Wayne, uh, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll have you talk about this one, but you know, um, getting an equipment, you know, it takes some time, right? So if, if there is a, a surge in demand or a surge in orders, you know, one of the ways that I've seen companies, um, complete the work and, and, you know, fulfill the orders <laughs> is by adding on, you know, additional shifts or bringing on uh, workers. So, I mean, that, that's why, that's why I think, you know, um, smart talent, you can talk about smart talent when, you know, how, how can smart talent help companies, you know, onboard uh, workers faster and, and actually keep those workers. Yeah. So again, um, smart talent is a, a program that was designed um, in Oregon and it basically works usually, you know, when, when you talk about, you know, onboarding, you usually think about, okay, I'm going to have to train these new um, college grad students coming on board or people that have no experience. Um, but what smart talent is, it's, it's kind of the, talk, it's actually working with the company owner and, you know, working with the, their HR department, working with their CEO to really understand their onboarding process and career development. Um, you know, based usually, you know, when, when we talk about hiring people, you kind of like have kind of an idea of what their daily chores is gonna do, what, what you want them to do, but you don't necessarily talk about career development when you hire somebody. And again, this is all depends on the type of position, but normally, you know, when you hire somebody, you want them to be with you for more than a year, more than two years, maybe three years if you're lucky. But normally, you know, and I've been to the same process where you go into an interview and, you know, the manager or whoever you're interviewing with is going to say, well, this is what you're going to do. Um, you know, you're going to you're going to do this or you're going to manage this project, but they don't necessarily tell you about your career path. You're probably going to start here doing this task for a year, but here's your potential of where you could be in three to five years. And that's where I think, you know, smart talent really works with the owners to really set it up where you, you really want to groom somebody when you bring somebody on board. Because again, I think, Wayne, I don't know what the exact number was, but I think they said when you bring somebody on and you spend the money to train, it's about 50% of their salary goes to just training. And, you know, if you train somebody for three months and they leave, that's, pretty much 50% of their yearly salary of what you were going to pay them down the drain, right? And so, you know, you want to make sure, and Smart Talent is a curriculum that, again, was, was developed in Oregon that works with managers to really kind of set up that career path for you um, to really understand, okay, is this person fit for what they're trying to do? But also, 
you know, put structure into onboarding. Right now, there's really no emphasis on structure, but this really, this program really helps you understand, um, you know, what needs to be done. And again, we talk about the millennials, we talk about the, the newer generations of, of workforce. They, they think a little differently, right? They're, they're thinking about, you know, what am I gonna gain by, by joining this company? So you really need, or the employer really needs to take time to really work with who you're bringing on, understanding the type of person that you're bringing on and not just think, you know, yeah, we're just gonna attempt to do that and we'll see how long it lasts. It's really different now, right? Maybe before in the olden days, it's, you know, that's kind of what was very effective. But now with the, you know, with the younger generation, they think differently. They want to see different things. They want to see growth, right? So I think it's really important that, you know, we, and, and that's why um, Smart Talent was, was developed, was to really, again, work with the company HR person, the CEO, to really kind of set up this curriculum or this structure before you so, you know, again, we have a program. Um, it's called, you know, it's the Smart Talent Training. I think Nicole, who is part of our program, runs that program. We have a training. I'm not too sure when the next training class or overview is, um, but it's really, it's really cool. It's a really good, effective way. And it's been proven out on the mainland that it really helps with the onboarding process and keeping your, you know, your, um, your new staff employed for a longer period of time. So, um, if you want more information, we can definitely throw up um, the link on the chat or you can email um, Wayne Layugan to um, maybe get more information about Smart Talent. Yep. Th thanks, Wayne. Yeah, so so definitely uh, if you have, you know, um, if workforce is one of your pain points or, or one of the areas you'd like to improve, you know, again, uh, just summarizing what Wayne said, you know, Smart Talents helps to grow your business by, you know, looking at your onboarding process, you know, your, your training and, and, you know, your, your career ladders, you know, and I think three words that describe smart talent, you know, it focuses on attracting uh, employees, uh, getting them effective training and then engaging with them. So they stay with the company. Um, so we're at about 10, 20. I know, uh, you know, some questions have been coming in through the chat, uh, but, but, you know, we're here until 1030. Uh, but if there are no further questions, you know, we're, we're fine giving you guys 10 minutes back um, to get on with more value added activity. So uh, again, we're here. Um, I'll post my email in the chat or our general email. So that way, if you guys have any questions um, after this, um, then we can definitely follow up. Great. Are there any final questions for Wayne or Trung? No, that's it then. So with that, we'll close today. Thank you very much to Innovate Hawaii, uh, Wayne and Wayne and, and Trung. Thank you very much, Trung, for joining us today. That was very informative. I was glad to learn more about your company. And uh, it's very exciting that we have companies in Hawaii that are working on robotics and these types of advanced activities. It means we're definitely moving forward. Uh, I'd like to thank again, uh, Jamie Lum and uh, DBET, as well as SBA for the funding that allows us to put on these programs. So with that, we'll wrap it up today. Please look for the video in about a week uh, to be uploaded to our YouTube archive and um, on the DBET website. And Wayne, you'll forward to me the uh, presentation and we can share it with anybody who needs it. Yep, absolutely. Great. Thanks again, everybody. Mahalo. Thank you, everyone.